Good evening, this is Mae Brussel. The title of this program is called World Watchers, and it's broadcast number 702, May the 20th, 1985. I want to correct one statement I made last week on the program, and if you have the sheets that accompany the tapes, you can make note on broadcast 701. I was uh, stating in the book by John Tolan, the book Battle of the Bulge, about Maxwell Taylor, who was indeed in the Battle of Bulge. He was a commanding general of the uh, 101st Airborne Division. But I went on to say that Maxwell Taylor worked with John Singlaub in the pre- Pentagon at the present time. It's not Maxwell Taylor. He's dead. It's Edward Lansdale. Uh, Taylor went on from the Battle of the Bulge area to Vietnam, where he's important in the destruction of villages, the counterintelligence, and the Phoenix program. And he worked over there with William Colby, who later became director of the CIA at home, and in uh, Vietnam with Edward Lansdale and John Singlaub. And after Vietnam was over, and at the current time working in our Defense Department, is John Singlaub with Edward Lansdale. William Colby also is part of the uh, operations to fund the Contras and the covert war to overthrow the Sandinistas, and also they fund the military dictatorship in El Salvador and help the repression, uh, genocide of Indians in Guatemala. The whole Central American uh, landscape is part of this team, but the one person not surviving from the past who is not part of it happens to be Maxwell Taylor. The others worked together, Lansdale and Colby at the Battle of the Bulge, but not uh, Taylor. He's dead. So I want to correct that. It was uh, Lansdale and not Taylor, it, who was in, with John Singlaub at the Pentagon. One quick quotation of the week of Henry Kissinger is this is from the Washington Star, Reverend Moon's paper with a picture of Henry Kissinger. Quotation for the day Americans tend to treat foreign policy as a subdivision of psychiatry instead of a real world matter. Henry Kissinger. Translated, it means you seem to have heart or empathy or identification with the beheadings and the blood letting down there, where the real world is one of blood and guts, and I, Henry Kissinger, run Central American policy. Again, quote, Americans tend to treat foreign policy as a subdivision of psychiatry instead of real world uh, matter. I think he's a subject for psychiatry, uh, more than enough. Now, last week you saw the burning down of 60 homes in Philadelphia, an organization titled MOVE, N-O-M-O-V-E, that has no other meaning. Uh, The head of MOVE is Ramona Africa, a gentleman who was not available. He escaped the fire, obviously an agent provocateur, trained by our CIA and counterintelligence, I'm sure, like Idi Amin was trained by Frank Turpel, leading these people this position. He sent a letter to the mayor that was the justification for burning things down, that uh, the body of America will soon fall, and we mean it. Now, that kind of talk that came out of this black man, Ramona Africa, is identical to the voice of the Aryan Nation, the National Alliance, of what would happen to America starting May the 1st. And sure enough, uh, America began to look bombed out, just like they said and burned out, and the police force were willing to do it, and so was the mayor. His justification was a letter saying that somebody was going to burn the neighborhood. Well, the next thing you do, because they're on uh, payroll anyway, is just bring in the fire department and keep hosing the place, and if they set a fire, you put the fire out. You don't tell the men not to show up. Just because Ramona Africa said he's going to burn the place doesn't mean that you tell the fire department they can't come to the fire. Uh, Another story, bomb was meant to gain entry. Uh, they knew what they were doing with that plastic explosive, and particularly if they didn't know they'd send in the fire department. Now, Ronald Reagan's whole shtick has been the Reichstag terrorism. Any of you that have listened to me for 14 years know the A to Z of that. Attorney General Edwin Meese isn't a lawyer. He's a soldier. His blood and guts is the Federal Emergency Magin- Management Agency, and I did a program at the time of the elections and before the nominate, renomination of Edwin Meese on all the military connections of Edwin Meese to the Emergency Service and National Guard and his uh, development and dependence upon them to keep people down as the system gets tighter and it's going to get tighter. I exposed this kind of operation in my article, The SLA is the CIA, 
and referred to Dr. Marcus Foster and the warnings and letters that by the Nazi party in California that they were going to shoot Dr. Foster, which they in fact did with a cyanide bullet, which is in fact a Nazi weapon, and it was done by white people, not black people shooting a black man with cyanide. The SLA is the CIA is an article you should read to understand the MOVE organization. It was written at the same time the MOVE were active before. You can get that from Tom Davis, Box 1107, Aptos, California, 95003. Another description of California and Ed Meese and Ronald Reagan that goes into the police state, computers and mentality is the one I did on the Korean Airlines for Larry Flint, February 84, the reprint and Hustler. Read that again. In fact, I was rereading that article again. I want to bring up certain points in a few minutes on it if I have time. Very important, the part of Edwin Meese and Ronald Reagan and John Reese and Western Goals and John Singlaub, Singlaub, this conductor of the Central American War, the Contra War, uh, the instrument through which Henry Kissinger and Fritz Kramer uh, can carry these things through in his role in California and the Western Goals, what they have in the computers, and the role of Mies and Reagan into terrorism agent provocateurs and uh, documenting peace uh, people and carrying on this kind of violence just as happened in Philadelphia. Now, there were two reasons to believe that these movements would come on soon. One uh, I've had on the air, and that was the statement of the Aryan nations and the National Alliance of their plan for the escalation of terrorism in America to make it begin to look like Vietnam. And the other was the plan to fortify the White House, which I didn't get to share with you before the burning happened. But this is typical of the siege mentality of Ronald Reagan and the people behind him the Secret Service to make you know that something terrible is going to start happening in this country with these crazies and so forth. Uh, March 27th, there was a story in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Herald, White House, a fortress in the making with a question mark and the plans to close off all the streets around the White House to have a huge area that uh, nine miles around that nobody can get to or touch. The director of the Secret Service, John Simpson, first suggested the idea to the subcommittee last week on security of the White House. And I'll bring up John Simpson, John R. S. I. M. P. S. O. N. in a moment. He is the president of Interpol, international police that work with drug dealers and Nazis and known Nazi terrorists and terrorists from the Middle East and around the world who wants to plant the idea like the Reichstag of fortifying the White House at a time where he's protecting the Nazis and the drug dealers and wants to turn America into a barricade. Mr. William Webster uh, had articles, there's one from the Oregonian sent to me, April the 12th, security zone plan doubted. He doesn't want to close off 90 acres, that's uh, several miles around the Nine House, White House. 90 acres is what they want to keep around the White House where no one can see it or get near it. They even suggested putting a tunnel underneath it so people come to Washington, they could never even get near or see it. San Jose Mercury, April the 6th, has a map of the Secret Service study of the White House and lists all the streets that would be cut off. An editor on the New York Times by Tom Wicker, The Security Mania, on what's going on in Washington. Is it really so necessary to protect the president or any future president? And he wonders, you know, if somebody really wanted them, they leave the White House and you could take them, say, going to Camp David every weekend. Uh, if he goes out to the country, goes to, through this road to Camp David, uh, and that's secure, then certainly why in Washington, D.C., can't people see the building at this historic thing where the president lives? So the, he does leave there. He doesn't live in tunnels. Another story that is a provocateur type of thing written by Robert Cooperman, K-U-P-P-E-R-M-A-N, a senior fellow at Georgetown University Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is the home base of Mr. Arnaud de Borsgrave and Claire Sterling and Michael Ledeen and Alexander Haig and, the and Edward Litwak and the terrorist mentality to whip us into a police state. He has an editorial with Adam Yarmolinsky, Y-A-R-M-O-L-I-N-S-K-Y. Big black letters, White House barricades aren't even a beginning like just wait and see what's going to happen. All of this was in March 
uh, before the move thing took place, warning you about uh, how dangerous it's going to be in America. Uh, in many stories, you probably saw them. I have maps here, Secret Service Eyes proposal to close the White House, and so forth. Now, April the 19th, in a newspaper called Peace and Solidarity, there's an editorial saying, take it to the streets. And that's one thing these people don't want. As Reagan says, you haven't seen anything yet. As it gets more repressive, people are going to go to the streets. So what they want is to barricade everybody and anyone making the policy and let the street people just scream and yell if they want. This article says it's time to take your protests into the street to show Reagan he had a mandate for the presidency, but he has no mandate for policies of war and racism. Well, they're wrong. If you didn't vote for him, you gave him that mandate. But they said on the east and west coast, there's broad coalitions of peeps people afraid of the warfare that we're going into, the minorities afraid of the racism that's coming out, the trade unionists, church, women, students, artists, and more will have to build a massive protest against Reagan's policies. Four more years of Reagan is scary for them, and they cited in this short period, six months since the election, he's cut off any dialogue in Nicaragua and wants to escalate the war against the elected people. He's sending napalm and bombs to the Salvadoran army to use against its own civilians. He's propping up the image of South Africa with George Schultz and the uh, policy that what's going on down there, that he has an iron fist policy of death and destruction in Lebanon, and this was printed before it was revealed that the CIA trained Muslims killed 80 women and children to get one Shiite that they didn't get. He got away like Ramona Africa in Philadelphia. That they're launching a billion dollar, multi billion dollar Star Wars, which is to militarize the heavens, where before the election they didn't say that it was a first strike offensive. That they're proposing the largest military budget ever and stealing from health, education, social services. This was written April 19th, a month before it was forced out of Casper Weinberger that they had a 50 million surplus in the Pentagon and they're telling you you don't need Amtrak and public transportation or mental health facilities and so forth. They said he appoints attorney general who claims busing and affirmative action are bad. Well, he did that before the re-election. But it's listing all the things that have happened in six months. The awareness of people suddenly hit them at the end of the election. And six months later, they were saying, take it to the streets. Now, the man who's proposing that you change the face of America, that you close off the White House, that you don't see it and get near it, is uh, Service Secret Service Director John Simpson, S-I-P-M-P-S-O-N. Now, there's a picture of John Simpson in Freedom Magazine. Freedom is uh, published by the Scientologists. And for the last five, six, ten years, they've had articles on the Nazis and mind control experiments. Uh, Fletcher Prouty has an article in there on the CIA and domestic intelligence. I'll give you the address at the end of the program to write to Freedom and subscribe and order the current issues or the back issues, as many as you can afford, because very early uh, they started to discover, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the role of Interpol with J. Edgar Hoover. Interpol is international police, and they detailed the role of the Nazis with J. Edgar Hoover, who was vice president of Interpol. And currently the president of Interpol is the same Secret Service agent, John Simpson, who wants to barricade Washington and works with the known Nazi and drug dealers and doesn't keep any lists, and according to the articles on Joseph Mengele and other people, they're not at all interested in Nazis. That's not terrorism. They're talking about the other kind. Now, May the 18th this week, a woman was awarded $39 million in Portland in an effort to break the Scientology organization completely. She claimed she joined it for one year. How much could she invest? She put $3,253 into it, and she sued them because they told her she could improve her eyesight and her intelligence in that one year. And they didn't improve her eyesight or intelligence. So the judge said that she could have $39 million. Now, the reason they let Bhagwan up in Oregon get off with what he's doing or all these Buddhas and phony religions and cults uh, do whatever they want is that they don't challenge or talk about the Nazi connections. That's a kiss of death. When you make the connections of the Gestapo, the Waffen SS, the Liebsden Dart, the Death Head to, oh, me, to our particular government, so this tough—I mentioned this tough settlement of thirty-nine million, which is 
totally out of line for no bodily injury or anything for one year to break their necks for writing continuous articles on Nazis and mental hospitals, Nazis and medical experiments, the CIA experimenting on people in South Africa, South African uh, taking over our press and buying newspapers here for their favor. That's their punishment, and the judge in Portland, Oregon, said, made this settlement, which is absolutely ridiculous, would put them out of business, and as I say, that's their punishment against them for giving you these stories. Actually, in one year, she did increase her intelligence because she went from having nothing to making $39 million. so maybe the Scientologists increased her intelligence so much. Uh, it's a bad joke, but uh, all of a sudden, she's $39 million richer if she gets it. Now, what are the Scientologists telling you and me that's costing them so much money? I'll share it with you because this is one story just recently. It's from Volume 17, Number 6 of their Freedom newspaper that came out on the uh, Interpol organization. And they're reviewing things that they have written for several years but may be new to many of you. It says, in September 1984, John R. Simpson, head of the United States Secret Service, was elected president of the International Criminal Police Organization. Inter means international, and P-O-L means police. It's all one word, Interpol, International Criminal Police Organization. And that's the same man who wants to barricade for 90 acres around the White House. It says, for Americans concerned with freedom and their rights, they should look into Interpol and their role in the world. Beginning in 1974, freedom began to disclose for researchers, Interpol's Nazi past and how it was formed and the international scandal of Interpol. And that's the time when L. Ron Hubbard went into hiding and said he was going to be killed and wasn't seen since. And this would be enough to have him bite the bullet uh, to print this kind of material. And if he is alive, I could understand why he would hide after this. His life wasn't worth a thing. Now, the article goes on. This Interpol was founded in 1923 in Vienna, Austria. This was the home base of Otto Skorzeny and Adolf Hitler and a lot of the top Nazis. And they were rebuilding after World War I the police system to fight labor union people and activists and people that they thought could be Bolsheviks or sympathetic to the communist revolution. So they'd have an international police that would pick up these people and follow them. Not the criminals. You know, to shoot a communist isn't a crime. To run over a Jew wasn't a crime. But it was formed in Austria in 1923, and in 1938, the Nazis, uh, after Adolf Hitler was in, took complete control of Interpol. And during that time period, up till they invaded Poland in 1939, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, was vice president of Interpol while working with Dr. Ernest Kalten Brunner, K A L T E N B R U N N E R, and SS officer Reinhard Heydrich. H-E-Y-D-R-C-H. When Hitler invaded Poland, J. Edgar Hoover took their pictures off the wall, but he was vice president with them. And remember that J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI was put into that office by Herbert Hoover when he was Secretary of Commerce, who was working for the rearmament of Germany and bringing these very Nazis into power. The article from Freedom says that the disturbing were uh, revelations primarily of the U.S. involvement with Nazi Interpol, and in 1940, the FBI still condoned and supported the Nazi police methods, as, such as the Night of the Long Knives, the massacres, the driving away of people at concentration camps were being built. He condoned and supported their methods, and he helped print their, wa their most wanted notices in the Interpol magazine, describing American fugitives as Jews, as Jewish types, as Jewish race, to identify certain people. The document showed that SS Gruben Fuhrer, Reinhard Heydrich, Gruben is a title, G R U P P E N, Gruben Fuhrer, F U H R E R, Reinhard Heydrich, H E Y D R I C H, the chief of the German security police known as the Hangman, and he was the man who conceived the final solution along with Adolf Eichmann, Heydrich and Eichmann under Otto von Bolschwing. The Hangman was president of Interpol from 1940 until he was murdered in 1942. He was succeeded by Ernest Carlton Brunner, who headed Interpol until he was hung at Nuremberg in 1946. The United States was active with Interpol. 
They shared news and agency and agency information and learned from 1968 to 1972, the president of Interpol, while we exchanged all this information, this is the time period after Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were killed and when Richard Nixon's in office, when Klaus Barbie escalates and begins the cocaine dealing down in uh, Bolivia with Joseph Mengele, who has total freedom down there, and Martin Bormann and those Nazis from uh, Nazi Germany living in South America and traveling to Spain during this time period, and we'll do more of that chronology, Paul Dickoff, D-I-C-K-O-P-F, as president of Interpol from 1968 till 72, until it was revealed that he was a member of the Waffen SS during World War II. The documentation showed his number, Waffen SS number 3372959, and their photographs of Dickoff in his SS track suit and so forth. Now, this article goes on that Interpol had nothing to do with finding Nazi war criminals. It was obvious because Nazis were Interpol's friends. Admits, admits, admits strenuous denials by Interpol officials. Evidence continued to emerge that left little room for doubt that Interpol maintained its Nazi connections and also its Nazi mentality. Now, this is out of Freedom Magazine talking about Interpol, and the point is that the president of Interpol at the present, t present time is the head of the United States Secret Service, John Simpson, and it's his idea to have that Reichstag siege mentality. He's working with the same people that created the Reichstag or the takeover of Germany for Adolf Hitler, and he's the one who wants the 90-acre area around the White House secured, working with people um, part of the Waffen SS of the Nazi Germany team that are still living, still in power, and our president of Interpol, hiding the drug dealers and hiding the Nazis, wants to turn the White House into something that Adolf Hitler would have, this area around it for siege mentality, psychological reasons that we're under a state of siege. It's totally unnecessary the president flies to Santa Barbara. Someone could just bomb that shack. There's only one house on the mountain. The whole thing is ridiculous, and but it, it's psychological and it's useful when you turn yourself then into a police state, you're already protected. Um, th that's a dangerous parallel to the past with the same people working in the same uh, function that they had earlier and if they had just died off. And that's the importance of talking about these Nazis is that World War II didn't end, but it continued and those people moved into our agencies and we share the agencies with them. Now, last week I mentioned that the search for Mangley will continue and there will be a frantic upheaval in many ways, and I suggest that even banking matters where Martin Borman actually controls Chase Manhattan Bank and many other banks in this country, and if the heat gets too heavy for Mangley, you'll see a lot of shifting sands. Now, I just want to give one example of what happened this week and how this uh, statement that I made connects to the past and Martin Borman and Joseph Mengele. Uh, after last week's broadcast, you read the story on the run for the banks in Maryland, and they uh, said they could only check out $1,000 a month. The particular people whose money is deposited there, depositors besiege Maryland thrift. This is a story from the Washington Post about the frantic problem in Maryland just last week. And Maryland is the location of many CIA and government people from Washington, D.C., who would be hurt by this particular action. Another story along those lines, May the 7th, 1985, bank failures expected to rise. FDIC puts the number of institutions on the problem list at 949, an all-time high that 949, almost 1,000 banks are ready to collapse. New York Post, March the 23rd, has, 23rd pardon me, has an article by J. Peter Grace, the master of them all, the co-worker, co-partner with Frederick Fleek, the Nazis from World War II and with Otto Ambrose, the chemist from Auschwitz and I.G. Farben. J. Peter Grace is, is saying in the New York Post that the American banking system is going to collapse. Uh, you're not safe. He says the banking system is fundamentally unsane. Uh, unsafe. He said, I suggest and urge bank depositors to get their cash out and put it in gold. The federal government has more than $2 trillion insurance in force, and the Grace Commission de determined that the reserves 
are not actually funded and are thus inadequate to meet potential future claims. They're not really there. He says, this is what J. Peter Gray says, against this $2.1 trillion potential liability, the Gray's Commission found that the government has accumulated reserves sufficient to cover only 1%, repeat, 1% of the potential claims when the banks fail. Now, who protects you when the banks fail? The FDIC, if you're lucky, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. From the Washington Post, February the 14th, 1985, Rusalot, a candidate for FDIC. John Rusalot, former uh, one of the founders and high uh, officials of the John Birch Society, has been nomin nominated as chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, the Reagan administration has him high on the list to be chairman of the FDIC. Now, Rousselot was the co-founder of the Ronald Reagan political campaign along with Patrick Frawley. Frawley, a member, early member of the Birch Society and a Knight of Malta. And Rousselot of the John Birch Society with Robert Welch out on the West Coast was one of the people who put his arms about Ronald Reagan and pushed him into the governorship. And then eventually they catapulted him into the presidency. John Rousselot would be in charge and chairman of the FDIC. Now, as an early founding member of the John Birch Society and continuously with it, he's worked with a fellow named Dr. Revillo Oliver, a professor of classics who I mentioned several weeks on the air, uh, weeks ago on the air, it was two weeks ago, May the 6th, program number 700, if you have the bib sheets. And I was talking about the relationship of the world Nazi organizations in Toronto of Mr. Zundel, Ernest Zundel, who says there was no Holocaust, and has worked with Liberty Lobby uh, out in California and in Illinois and in Munich, Germany, with Otto Skorzeny, and the role in Illinois of Zundel with Ravillo Oliver of the John Birch Society, who helped fund Ronald Reagan. Now, Ravillo Oliver is part of the John Birch Society with John Russolo, but he's also on the board. He's a member of the Council of a Committee to Restore the Constitution run by Archibald E. Roberts, a lieutenant colonel, who has books and articles out in newsletter on the Federal Reserve and the national debt. And the point is that the FDIC is in, pro is in trouble, that the far right wing and people like Rousselot, uh with uh, Mr. Oliver and Mr. Roberts want to rearrange some other financial structure that may or may not be right, but have direct links down to South America. And I did a try to describe a diagram of Revillo Oliver with Otto Scorzeni down in Buenos Aires in Argentina with Martin Borman and with Joseph Mengele. So when I say that Mengele and Borman can shake the, ban the banks, you have J. Peter Grace saying there is no money. You have a chairman coming in, John Russell, out of the Birch Society, who will be in charge of the FDIC to decide which banks are covered that can have the 1%, the possibility of almost a 1,000 banks folding, and the connections of these people to Martin Bormann and Joseph Mengele and the Nazis and the late Otto Skorzeny, of course. But it's a very close connecting link that will affect the banks that are affecting it, and that's why J. Peter Grace can smile and say, I told you so, because he's part of that inner team. Now I'm going to shift gears here, not to anything separate from what I've talked about, but it's continuous and it has to do with Joseph Mengele again because of the relationship of Mengele to Borman in the banks and also to Klaus Barbie and the rush to find Joseph Mengele at this time. Ted Rubenstein called me this weekend. He's a researcher with a good fast eye, saw Newsweek magazine and said, run and get Newsweek of May 20th, 1985. And on page 37 is the name that it took May Brussels two and a half years to smoke out. It says in black letters, keeping in touch, Joseph Mangley still has a lawyer in Frankfurt named Fr Fritz Steinacker, S-T-E-I-N-A-C-K-E-R. And recently, the attorney went beyond no comment. He was asked about his relationship with Joseph Mangley, and he said, yes. I have represented Mangley, he told Newsweek, and I still do represent him. Now, it'll take us probably till 1987 or 1989 for them to give more connections of this case and how Steinecker was smoked out.
because of the deposits in Mangley's account that come from Klaus Barbie or that John DeLorean took them out of his company to put them there. But th things are happening a little faster now. And finally, Steinacker's name is in the news. Uh, the n I'll take a one-minute break now and come back some more to Joseph Mengele and the importance of the Mengele story and why it's in the news at this time. This is Mae Brussel. The name of the program is World Watchers. This is side two of broadcast number 702, May the 20th, 1985. And I'm quoting from a Newsweek article postdated May the 20th, 1985. Uh, this article puts down at the bottom of the corner the, the Reverend Moon newspaper, the New York, the, pardon me, the Washington Times is also offering a $1 million reward for Joseph Mengele, and I briefly mentioned this to you before, Reverend Sun Ming Moon's Unification Church. I saw a one-hour program on the Aryan Nations and Richard Butler on television this past week, and they take up a pledge of allegiance, of one nation, one race, and one God. And the uh, explanation of the unification, the use of unification as a word, for the Aryan nations that they believe that this country should be only one race, only one God, and that they should all be combined in this one nation. Now, Richard Butler, who believes all this, trained at Lockheed Aircraft with the United States Defense Department. He learned this identity religion from Colonel William Gale, who was in the Pacific in guerrilla activities in the Philippines with Charles Willoughby and General Wiedemeyer. And also over there in the Philippines was Dr. Loyal Davis before his adopted daughter Nancy uh, came into the scene as a political wife. Dr. Davis came back from the Philippines to Chicago. Then Dan Nancy went to Hollywood and MGM for the Ronald Reagan connections. Um, this is important because the unification name of the church is identical to the unification group. And out of the Philippines and out of uh, Taiwan, and South Korea with the Korean CIA in the United States, uh, CIA and Mr. Ryosha Sasakawa, a uh, Nazi war, a, a Japanese war criminal, not a Nazi, a fascist, Japanese war criminal during World War II came to the Unification Church and their membership and helping to form the World Anti-Communist League with members of the Waffen SS. So I don't think it's a coincidence that both of them use the name unification to mean to bring together these factors of only one race and one God and one nation. Uh, the far right wing always complains that the Rockefellers and Chase Manhattan and the Council of Foreign Relations want one country, but they discount the far right naturally. They want to break down one which isn't perfect and which also works along with them, but don't call attention to the goal of one unification under these very, very extreme right-wing groups which they work with. And, of course, that's why they don't call attention to them. One item in the uh, Newsweek about the administration of Mr. Strassner. He is from Germany. He is from uh, Bavaria. He went down to Paraguay and became head of the military dictatorship. That country is similar to Germany as Puerto Rico is to us, and it's an extension of Nazi Germany. And this article says the Israelis developed a strange bedfellows relationship with Strassner's right-wing German-flavored dictatorship. As Paraguay supported Israel in the United Nations. They hired Israel to train its armed forces and maintain their airlines, and the Mossad works with General Strassner. Now, Israel knew where Mengele was in Paraguay. Simon Wiesenthal knew where he was in Paraguay. Israel trains the armed forces down there that are sterilizing the Indian population in Paraguay. Joseph Mengele is over in Uruguay teaching torture and even killing Jews and experimenting on them. And they knew that in Israel. I mentioned last week, and Simon Wiesenthal knew it. Israel arms and trains, helps the broader ban in South Africa. The military Nazi dictatorship that was in power in Argentina now being tried for murder and other crimes of former presidents. Israel arming and training with General Somoza and Mr. Pinochet, the Nazi in Chile. You have to keep repeating and evaluating what is the country of Israel? Who are those people in Israel? Who is Simon Wiesenthal? And this is just one example of Newsweek showing you the rule of working with Mr. Strassner 
and why people weren't interested in Joseph Mengele all along. Now, uh, I did mention since 1983 about the relationship of Fritz Steinacker, the attorney for Mengele, depositing narcotic money from, Meng from Barbie to Mengele's bank account in Switzerland. I'm going to give you a new name that I've had for two years. I sent it in a letter to Mr. Murray Sams, who has this had a multi-million dollar suit against John DeLorean Investments. I don't know what he ever did with the information. But this is new for you listeners because I was protecting the name, but being as it took two and a half years to get Fritz Steinacker's name into Newsweek, I'm going to give you another name. The courier for the money is a man named Harold Buell. He grew up in Chicago, went to Catholic schools there, H-A-L-B-U-E-L-L. He's the bureau chief of the Associated Press. He's the courier of narcotic money, narcotics money from uh, South America or Central America into the accounts of the Nazis in the Swiss bank accounts. And uh, I'm giving you that name. as I was protesting it until more of this came out, but because... Newsweek and the New York Times and the various writers have all this information and prefer to protect these people, knowing that this information can be investigated and what I'm telling them is turning out to be exactly true. Then I have to continue the policy that I do on Kazoo and give you that information first before you ever hear it or see it anywhere else. I've been working with that since 1983 and I've been discussing this on the air since August the 1st, 1983. Now, Ralph Blumenthal of the New York Times uh, has a story on Joseph Mangley, and uh, it's dated May the 11th, 1985, if you want to copy it from your library. It's about the various law officials meeting with Joseph Mangley, and I just want to cite certain things in there that I think are important, not his general chronology of life, but he gives his birth date, March 16th, 1911, and then jumps to... 1933, that at the time of the rise of Hitler, that Mengele joined the SA. The SA were the assault sections. Um, this is 1933, the assault sections. The brown shirts, the stormtroopers, defined as the original elite strong arm force of Hitler's National Security Party. He doesn't say that. I'm giving you a definition of the SA. They were purged and broken up in 1934 when Ernest Rome, R-O-H-M, was killed. That was the thing that triggered off the night of the Long Knives and the murders that took place. And then it goes on in 1937. It jumps from 33 to 37. Mengele joined the Nazi Party, and in 1939 he was married and then went to a research institute for racial purity in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, I don't know how many years he was at Frankfurt studying racial purity, but from Frankfurt, Germany, um, Mr. Fritz Kramer he was there and then went to Rome and then came to the United States where he got settled until he was in Army Intelligence and brought German-born Henry Kissinger under his arm to go back to Europe to mingle with the Nazis when the war was over. Now, I gave Ralph Blumenthal and all the others the FBI reports about the naturalization of Joseph Mengele and how the FBI said that he would have been naturalized in the United States according to their documents December the 5th, 1932. And that's identical to Dr. Herman Urban, the fellow that was naturalized in the United States, and then went to Germany, Austria, and became a member of the Gestapo, the SS, the stormtroopers, and then eventually rounded up and met people such as Errol Flynn and World Nazi organizations uh, tied directly to Martin Bormann, Adolf Hitler, Rudolf Hess, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the Hollywood crowd, the Mexico crowd, the Nazis, and the Bahamas. Now, uh, this chronology just mentions 1933, he joined the SA, the Stormtroopers. But a year before, according to the FBI reports, Joseph Mengele, similar to Dr. Urban, was naturalized. The same FBI report that was dated 1966 said that February the 9th, 1944, there was a question of denaturalization proceedings against uh, uh, Joseph Mengele because his name was on a Nazi party list. And according to the New York Times and Ralph Blumenthal's report, in 1937, he joined the Nazi Party. So the FBI had a record that he was naturalized in 1932, and uh, that by 1944 they were going to denaturalize him because of the uh, war going on in the midst of the war. 
and they were going to take away his papers. At that time, he was working at Auschwitz. Uh, this FBI report has been ignored by Simon Wiesenthal, by the New York Times, by the lawyers on this case, by the FBI. But the, it's an FBI document, and it can't go away because the person who sent for it originally, and I was the first one in the United States that I know of to have it, got it because he was in Honduras with his uncle who was sitting with Joseph Mengele, and that's how he happened to send for this because he was right down there with him. So I bring this up again because the chronology in the New York Times, it's printed May the 11th, 1985, isn't much different than um, what I'm telling you could fit directly into the time slot that doesn't prove or disprove, but it makes it more possible because there's a space in those years that is not accounted for. Now, this article also says that in 1965, Joseph Mengele went to meet Otto Scorzeni in Spain, and they thought he was there again in 1970. Now, remember, Otto Scorzeni, or maybe you don't remember, was the gentleman, according to the latest reports, who helped Joseph Mengele escape from Europe down to South America to Buenos Aires, and then he went from there to Paraguay. Henry Kissinger was in charge of Otto Scorzeni, according to Charles Hyam's new book, American Swastika and John Loftus's Reports. Henry Kissinger, these are all the protege of that great Fritz Kramer I'm trying to smoke out, was in charge of Klaus Barbie in South America. Barbie, Scorzeni, and Mengele all worked together, all were a team. Scorzeni came out of the Battle of the Bulge, Mengele from Auschwitz, and Klaus Barbie from France. And the three of them, one from killing the French resistance from that area, the other doing the experiments in Poland at Auschwitz, and the other involved with the Battle of the Bulge and with Martin Bormann and the funding for the resurgence of the Nazis later were all directly linked to Henry Kissinger and his mentor, of course, was Fritz Kramer. So that Ralph Blumenthal has Mengele identified in Spain in 1965 and in 1970. 65 was three years after the assassination of John Kennedy, and 1970 was Richard Nixon was in power, and Klaus Barbie could openly begin as the cocaine king, and the Nazis could resurge. Nixon had a long history of sympathy with the Nazis, and bringing Nikolai Malaksa to his office in Whittier, the head of the Iron Guard, and working with Otto von Bolschwing, and that was the Galen Network. So they were home free and could travel and do more. As soon as the the two Kennedys were out of the way. In 1965, Robert Kennedy was still alive, but pretty soon, by the 70s, the Kennedys were dead, and there would be no more Democratic candidates that would oppose what could be the future Nazification of this country. The New York Times has a story May the 15th, 1985, on General Strassner, and it tells uh, he was born in Bavaria, and this report says that he's going now to back to Germany with all of this activity going on, and with the President of the United States honoring the Waffen SS, that he's been invited by an organization called the Institute for the Development of German Paraguayan Relationships. Well, that'd be like the governor of Puerto Rico coming to the United States for an institute for the friendship of Puerto Rico with the United States. This is simply a means of his appearing here and trying to explain some of the things that are going on. Now, he's going to be entertained by Franz Joseph Strauss, the Bavarian Prime Minister. I mentioned Franz Joseph Strauss several weeks ago, April 29th, almost a month ago. The Bavarian Minister, the President of Bavaria, a staunch Nazi who said to Ronald Reagan, don't go to Bitburg, and I said the reason he didn't want him to go, and the reason Manfred Rommel, the mayor of Stuttgart, the son of the Desert Fox, the Field Marshal Rommel, didn't want this opening up these wounds is that they were now making these new contacts. Rossner would be coming, and this was calling attention to all the activity that they didn't want, began to bring out more articles on Nazism than had been out in the last 10 years. Maybe I should say in the last 40 years, more has come out in the last few weeks, besides an occasional book review or so. But Mr. Strauss is now on his way uh, in July, to Bavarian. I'm sure he's going to talk about Simon Wiesenthal. And one of the people who doesn't want to be seen with him is Richard von Weissacker, that very controversial uh, person. He was in Hitler's army. He was an attorney in Hitler's Germany. He represented his father, the Nazi war criminal. He said he's going to spend an extended summer vacation abroad. He doesn't want to be seen visibly with Mr. Strassner at the time of this great reunion. 
after the Pittsburgh incident, uh, he's bowing out, although Helmut Kohl is anticipating this visit. And uh, uh, I'll do more on Kohl's relationship to Strausner in a few moments. But I do want to, before time runs out, just go into Reverend Moon and Gulf Oil and their money into Korea and into Bolivia and the tangled web of the Mellon family with particularly these two countries, Bolivia when Klaus Barbie was in the height of working for the government with the death squads and also with drug dealing and with Mangley, and with the takeover of the Washington Star by the Reverend Moon paper. Why would Reverend Moon, under Mr. Ahmad, A-M-A-U-D, it's Ahmad, I call it, there's no R in there, A-M-A-U-D, small d-e, Borschgrave, B-O-R-C-H, G-R-A-V-E, the editor-in-chief of the Washington Times, putting an ad wanting Joseph Mengele when the World Anti-Communist League, when Reverend Moon and Ryosha Sasakawa and this whole organization of Southeast Asia and the Wafen SS combined have worked with Moon and Barbie uh, and the Death Squads and uh, Mengele and Skorzeny ever since World War II. This team have been instrumental in stirring up these troubled areas and uh, putting in fascism, if they could, and terrorism, why would Reverend Moon be running a million-dollar reward? Now, in uh, the American Swastika, Charles Hyam talks about John J. McCloy, the High Commissioner of Germany, who we've mentioned before, who was in charge of Klaus Barbie and kept the relationship and had, in quotes, a special relationship with Klaus Barbie in the CIC, the intelligence system, and it was John J. McCloy that released all the top Nazis and also Mr. von Weissacker, Richard von Weissacker's father, the A to Z of Nazis. Um, this American swastika refers to John J. McCloy and his particular caring for and protecting Klaus Barbie. And uh, getting to the role of John J. McCloy, I got out my hearings. I have five or six volumes on the Korea Gate hearings and their influence peddling in various countries that were being examined in 1978. Now, the, before I get to the hearings, the Washington Times, in addition to that big ad they run a quarter of a page all, almost every week, the Washington Times, Tuesday, May 7th, has a full page on Michael Ledeen. Ledeen is a great counterintelligence with Mr. DeBorschgrave. He works with John Singlaub. He's a protege of Alexander Haig. Again, Haig's mentor is Fritz Kramer. So it goes from Kramer to Haig to Ledeen, and he works with Claire Sterling, and they make up the lies about the KGB trying to shoot the Pope. And there's a full-page picture, a quarter of a page of Ledeen, and a new article, Michael Ledeen's Grave New World. It's in the same issue uh, again, that they're advertising this reward for Mengele. And I question the paper. They have full-page pictures of Daniel Graham of the Star Wars and the co-partner with Fritz Kramer, and they'll have a full page of John Singlaub. And this week it's Michael Ledeen of Disinformation, Counterintelligence, and General Mischief. So I got out, as I say, the hearings on the um, Koreagate influence peddling. Incidentally, the subcommittee staff director was Robert Bocher, B-O-A-T-T-C-H-E-R, we've mentioned him before. He went flying out a window and was murdered in New York this year. Another member of the committee is Leo Ryan, who was murdered down in Guyana. And the gist of the parts I want to share with you from the investigation of Korean-American relations has to do with John McCloy, who so carefully protected Klaus Barbie along with Henry Kissinger. And when the question of Gulf oil came up, which is the Mellon family, Richard Mellon Scaife and all the Mellons, at the time of the paying of, of Korea, South Korea, the man in charge of the investigations was John J. McCloy. Judge John Sarik in the district court in Washington decided that because the Security and Exchange Commission wanted an investigation, that the chairman would be John McCloy, who uh, covered up not only the killing and murder of John Kennedy, but protected Klaus Barbie, and now he's to help them look into the money of the Mellon family. And I and this document or a series of documents on the Korean American relations goes into the Mellons giving money to South Korea. Specifically on page eight eighty three, they put three hundred million into South Korea. This was in nineteen seventy eight of the hearings. And they got a hundred and fifty million back. And they can't account for the other hundred and fifty million. And I'm wondering if the Mellons bought the Washington Star as their voice 
because of their unlimited millions and millions of dollars. I did one broadcast on just a little bit of where some of their money goes. And so they call it a loss to South Korea. And at the same time, they're giving money to South Korea. They're giving it to the Bolivian government. Page 883, Gulf's earnings from Korea. Senator Percy, you indicate your investment totaled $300 million. What, have you, recent, what are your e recent earnings from Korea on that investment? Have you broken that up? This is from Gulf Oil. No, not precisely. At one time, I could probably give you a measure. Our total exposure at one time was $300 million. We've been there 12 years, but we haven't recovered the under... The other, $150 million, that's unaccountable for $150 million out of South Korea. Then they said, is Bolivia's case the same? Was it an illegal contribution by Bolivian law? And Senator Percy asked, and it seems that they were heavily funding the Bolivian government when investigated in 1978. And as I say, Klaus Barbie was instrumental in part of the Bolivian government. John J. McCloy is supposed to be questioning Gulf Oil and their distributions of money, and it's John McCloy who had worked with Klaus Barbie down there, and uh, Henry Kissinger was working with Klaus Barbie and Otto Skorzeny, and Skorzeny arranged the trip down to South America for Joseph Mengele. Now, this investigation, uh, page 836, goes into the money in Bolivia, and Senator Percy said, on behalf of Senator Case, how many people and individuals in Bolivia knew of your political contributions there? He says, I really don't know. And it talks about Gulf Oil's money in Italy and in South Korea and their Bahamas fund. We're talking about $300 million. Now, the Washington Post had a story February 28, 1985, to show you a little bit about the Mellon money. Pittsburgh millionaire financed Westmoreland suit against CBS. And there's a picture of Richard Mellon Scaife, the man behind the Heritage Foundation, behind Edwin Meese, who makes the foreign and domestic policies for Ronald Reagan. Scaife put up $3 million tab for Westmoreland's suit against CBS, Richard Mellon Scaife. And he said, furthermore, the $3 million went to Capital Legal Foundation, and Dan Embert would get more money. Scaife, a grand, great-grandson of the founder of the Mellon Oil and Banking Empire, was the real funder for the Westmoreland case that tried to break the back of CBS. That was pennies for them, and he said he would do more, and with that kind of money, and they worked with Mr. Dobison and Mr. Jesse Helms and the far right wing. They can continue to uh, uh, finance and eventually take over CBS. And, of course, Dan Rather, because it cost poor Richard Mellons gave $3 million to try to break the back of Dan Rather with his story about Westmoreland. Uh, the point is that the Mellons have this unlimited hundreds of millions of dollars. They could put $300 million into countries like South Korea or Bolivia, the uh, person guarding the house, the investigator, is the same John McCloy, just like the late Leon Jaworski, who's always called in to protect companies such as the Gulf Oil. And these companies fund these death squads and combine newspapers and conceal the network of that Odessa that they wholeheartedly support. So the importance of uh, Reverend Moon's paper is the people that he has photographed every week, as I say, it's a rogues gallery of counterintelligence of far right wing material. It's really a paper that Richard Mellonscape would love to own, and I wouldn't doubt that he does own it. And the purpose of getting the paper to oppose the Washington Post and Catherine Graham and all the articles that I cite that are factual that try to reveal what's going on at congressional hearings, and you'll you'll hear me say over and over again, Washington Post and New York Times. Well, the Reverend Moon paper has these wonderful, huge uh, photographs of uh, Jean Kirkpatrick and J. Peter Grace, and it's one page after the other of the real right-wing group that want to control and strangle this country. And again, interestingly enough, they keep running uh, this ad that they want information on Joseph Mengele when they are the last people in the world who would care about one experiment at Dachauer Auschwitz who would care about one victim of Nazism, who would care about one drop of the drug running they did. They want to get the names of the people that uh, know about Joseph Mengele so they can turn it over to people like John Singlaub or from these mercenaries and I'm sure have a huge attack on knowledgeable people such as Mr. Bocher, the one who was the investigator for this committee who a few years later goes flying off a building 
from New York City and just splash at the bottom and that's the end of him. They want information so that they can get rid of the witnesses and they don't give a darn or a damn about Nazis or Joseph Mengele for his crimes. They want to know who knows where he is so they can take care of that person. I mentioned before the ad is like a vacuum, but when you read the Korea Gate hearings and you realize how much the melons are involved in these various countries where these activities are taking place and running ads at the same time, uh, you have to question, of course, what the purpose is of those ads. Now, many of you read this last week that Mr. Cole's party suffered a stinging defeat in Germany. He felt that having Ronald Reagan come to the summit meeting before the elections would do him good. He underestimated the people, as I stated before. In the summit meeting was to be in June, and he pushed it up to May so that he would get a strong re-election vote. It didn't work. New York Times, May 13th, Cole's party suffers a stinging defeat. Los Angeles Times, May the 13th, Cole's party loses the state vote. Another one, LA Times, Social Democrats assail Cole over Reagan, the idea that he defended Bitburg, and they blame him for pushing the visits to Berg and Belson, for uh, resurrecting all these bones and the facts, and uh, that he shouldn't have brought all this out, and that he was stubborn, and it ruined the party. But he's not afraid of ruining the party. Helmut Kohl has set up two more parties. The New York Times has described May the 16th, 1985. New risk for Helmut Kohl. This is one to entertain the Silesians. Those are the group from Poland that have been taken over. They are refugees from the Silesia area who are responsible for some of the terrible war crimes that I described and want to get back to later on future broadcasts. And he also is ready to entertain Mr. Strassner from Paraguay. Uh, the government, according to the New York Times, said the Chancellor Cole will hold two political risky encounters and address, he's going to address a gathering of the Silesian Germans in June, and then he's going to, in Bonn, Bonn in July, entertain General Alfredo Strassner from Paraguay. The latest issue of having uh, the Silesians be entertained by Helmut Kohl was brought up in a newspaper uh, they questioned whether he should do this at this time. There was an uproar over Reagan's visit to Bidberg Military Cemetery, where soldiers of the Waffen SS are, and the two events on the Chancellor's cal calendar have developed the potential for further embarrassment for him. Now, is this embarrassment that he has to take because these people now control him and are giving orders? Of course it is. The same article goes on to say that also under fire was a speech published by Richard von Weissacker with language that had anti-Semitic innuendos and also accusations about Hitler being the only one responsible, the lone planner for World War II. So the people in West Germany began to be uh, more conscious of Richard von Weissacker and what he is saying. He had his speech published uh, the 40th anniversary of the end of the war, he had 250,000 copies sent to be distributed in every school. And the papers there are outraged, and they accuse him of assertions that he shouldn't make, and they had to do with the persecution of Jews. So that Mr. Cole and Mr. von Weissacker, who thought that the 40 years had passed and that all these bones had been put to rest, underestimated their plans uh, and the reaction of the people. So instead of accepting the entertainment of the Silesians and honoring them in June and entertaining Mr. Strausner in July. Uh, he's under pressure. It doesn't mean he won't go through with it. He'll certainly go through with it, but it means that the people there are more aware of it and they're vocalizing it, and they never would have done that if Ronald Reagan hadn't insisted on going to the cemetery of the Waffen SS. I don't have the uh, address of freedom where you can order these articles on Interpol and Nazi experimentations and our government's role with Interpol, but I'll bring it to you. I'll have it for you next week. In the meantime, I'll wind this hour down. I want to include a new story on the Korean jet line, but no use opening it up now. I'll do it next week. Thank you very much for sending me the clippings, and people around the country keep sending me wonderful articles and clippings. I can't write each time. I appreciate them very much and use them. As you can hear on these broadcasts, you might recognize things that you've sent to me. And so I'll thank all of you right now, and I'll be back with you next week. This is Mae Brussel, and uh, you keep reading books and articles and see these interesting developments as they come together.
I always forget to add, I close in such a hurry, that you can write to me in care of P.O. Box 22155, Carmel 93922, and have a self-enclosed, uh, put a stamp in an envelope, self-enclosed, and I'll send you sheets of source material that I have for each broadcast. I type them up, and then you can look up those articles at the library and get them yourself and it would be easier to understand some of these stories if you read the original sources and they are available for you. So write to me at that P.O. box and I'll get these off to you. In the meantime, this is Mae Bressel and I'll say goodbye and start saving your articles about terrorism in America, about uh, bombings and bombs that were reported that didn't take off, fires that are started, arsons, and watch the escalation of domestic terrorism in California and throughout the country, as it was in California when Reagan and Meese were in charge of things here, watch how it spreads throughout the nation in the next months to come, in the next year, in fact. Meanwhile, as I say, this is May, and I'll be back with you next week.